Hello, hello, testing. All right, should we start this? Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Or should I say good morning or good evening if you're still jet lagged? Uh, my name is Mike Metrol, and my talk is What Should I Know About Insert Container Project Here? Over the next 40 minutes, I plan on covering several of the key projects in the container space, how it relates to OpenStack, and what each project entails. Because there's such a wide breadth of projects out there, and I have a very small amount of time, my idea is to try to cover as many of them as possible in kind of rapid fashion so you guys kind of get an insight into the depth of the projects. So I figured I want to do something a little bit different uh, in terms of the format to go about this, so let's play a little game. How many of you are familiar with speed networking or speed dating? Kind of show of hands. Okay, most of you. To make sure things don't get lost in translation, um, speed networking is when you have a group of people that are interested in meeting one another, but a very small amount of time. And the idea is you get paired one on one, you have about one minute to tell them who you are, what you do, kind of the highlights of who you are, et cetera. And you move on to the next person in round robin fashion until you meet everybody. With the idea being that you get exposed to everything out there, and then you branch off into somewhat of a tangential conversation based on whatever piqued your interest. So I figured this is a great format to expose you to the various projects out there. So let's start with an example. When you meet somebody, you finally, you kind of know who their name are, or what their name is, a couple of facts about them. They tell you some things you may not know and some endorsements. So an example, my name is Mike. Um, I'm a product architect at Rackspace. Been in there for the last three and a half years. Last year and a half, I've been very heads down into the container space, doing R&D work as well as market surveillance. Some things you may not know about me, joy coding and go. Love to play golf in my free time. My favorite editor is Vim. And according to my LinkedIn profile, I've gotten endorsements for Python, Cloud Computing Bash, and yes, even Reddit. The things you can get endorsed on there never cease to amaze me. So you guys get the gist. Let's get into containers. All of you are pretty smart individuals. We all know what containers are, but to make sure we're all on the same page, containers really bring about four to six times more utilization and efficiency per application compared to traditional VMs and hypervisors. The way they've been adopted really has aided in faster development and iteration, and they operate at pretty much close to bare metal speeds. Some things you may not know, um, and people ask me this a lot, containers are not just to enable a PaaS layer. They can certainly do that, but sure enough, there's much more to them. They can uh, modernize your stack. They can be integrated into your CI CD pipeline. And the footprint of them is much, much smaller. A trend I've been noticing over the last couple of years, or not a couple of years, the last couple of months, um, that I find interesting is that many legacy and enterprise focused organizations are looking to uh, jump their apps from their current implementation straight to containers, skipping over VMs. Now, that may be because they never really made the jump into the cloudy way. But nevertheless, they're seriously considering containers to do so, which is a trend that I find very, very, very interesting. Some things you may not know off the bat also about containers is that they all share the same underlying kernel. So containers running um, Ubuntu and Debian can definitely work on, on the same host, but Windows containers running next to Debian containers, for example, aren't the case. So it's very different from virtual machines. They're very lightweight, they make app isolation easier, and they can play well across all sorts of platforms. All right, we pretty much got that. So containers are great and all, but let's talk about the runtimes that really bring out the full features of containers. Docker is the most popular one that's abstracted LXC. And they did so in a way that it made it into a pluggable architecture, if you will, as well as they established a model to package and distribute applications far better than what we had before. I constantly get asked this, but the Docker engine is really the only abstraction layer you need um, to enable cross-platform portability. So if you've ever tried to take a virtual machine from, say, AWS to OpenStack to Rackspace or what have you, you've noticed that the pain points in that are very obvious. The, the boot and init process varies from platform to platform. Also, the sizes of these, these VMs can be a couple, different, uh, a couple sizes of gigabytes. Transferring VMs from one platform to the other can take numerous amounts of time. And containers are very lightweight in that respect, so they, they allow for more usefulness and elasticity in terms of not just your resources, but how you use them. The Docker Hub is a collection of over 100,000 applications. For the sake of an example, it's like the App Store, but for servers. And it's really uh, neat in terms of what you can find on there. Um, so I can take uh, an OpenStack container, I'm sorry, an, an OpenVPN container, or MySQL, or a Postgres, and I can have it running within seconds, not knowing a single thing about how that tool or technology works, which is very different from, say, trying to build whatever binary it is you're, you're trying to install, as well as uh, maintain it. 
So it's really evolved how we look at SAC uh, applications in traditional servers. Docker runs on all modern Linux distros that are 64-bit, and there's recently been added support for 7, Windows 7.1 and up. They're very fast, and they're actually being embraced by the entire industry as we speak. With new competition, it naturally, uh, sorry, with new technology, it naturally reads competition. And this is exactly what CoreOS's rocket is really aimed at doing. It competes with Docker. And it's doing this in a very different way. Rocket is really an implementation of the new, uh, this new AppC spec that's being developed uh, as an open source spec in the community. They're defining different ways of how you actually describe and run and manage and how you enable discovery protocols for containers that are very different from the Docker way. So much so that uh, the Docker manifest and the spec that really defines what a container is in the Docker world was done so after the fact that Docker was created. Whereas Rocket said, or as CoreOS said, for Rocket, let's actually build up the spec, let's throw it out in the community, let's make sure that everyone agrees on this, and then we'll implement it. So it's definitely a more kind of thoughtful approach to it. And Rocket's really aimed at tackling the enterprise primitives um, around containers, particularly around security and image auditing. It also brings its own new image format, known as Aki, um, which is, again, different from the way that Docker is defining images. It's still under heavy development uh, and not production ready, but it's definitely getting there. And one key thing that the CarOS folks uh, were harping on when it comes to Docker is that Docker established what we know as the container, and it made it popular. But they started dabbling into other things that didn't really necessarily relate back to true containers, such as launching cloud servers, creating systems around clustering, enabling wide functionality with regards to building and running images, networking, et cetera, et cetera. And they were packaging this into this one large monolithic binary. So Rocket said, well, we really need to just focus on the true building blocks of what a container is and what we as an industry want it to be. And that's what it's trying to do. A couple of endorsements around Rocket. Uh, Intel's uh, Clear Containers effort is partnering, they partnered with CoreOS to enable the security joint effort to ingrain security as a core concept of Rocket. Kubernetes, which I'll get to later, um, recently added support for Rocket. And there's been many implementations of the AppC spec um, out in the open. So much so, I think there's like four or five uh, implementations of the AppC spec, which is four or five more than Docker. So that says a lot about what the community thinks about Docker and where they think it should be going. So containers are great and all, but how do they relate to OpenStack? Well, for one, if you're not familiar already, uh, the OpenStack Docker driver is really about being able to instantiate containers through Nova instead of virtual machines. It uses Glance as a back-end image registry for Docker as opposed to running your image registry in a container. It's a StackForge project. And essentially, for all practical purposes, the Nova Docker driver is an HTTP client that talks to and controls Docker via the API. And it works well with DevStack. So pretty simple. That's great and all, but we need something more. And that's what Magnum is really aimed at accomplishing. Um, sorry, Adrian, if you're watching. Couldn't help myself to embed a Tom Selleck PNG, so you kind of have to do that. Anyways, um, containers are great and all, but you really need to think about the fact that they're very different in terms of the life cycle of how you develop them, how you use them. And those are very different for virtual machines. And so Magnum is aimed at being this container service that makes uh, containers a first-class citizen in OpenStack. It uses heat to deploy Swarm, Kubernetes, and Mesos, just, just a couple of container orchestration engines. And it really is about providing uh, abstraction uh, in the twofold manner. The first abstraction layer is what's known as the bay type. And what this does is it allows multiple tenants to instantiate the container orchestration engine, or COE for short, of their choosing, and it allows it to run side by side with other tenants, very similar to how the virtual machines are done. It also provides an abstraction layer from the API perspective of how you deploy it. So Magnum's job is really about saying, hey, I want to deploy the this, this COE. Once it's done, drop me down to the native API of the respective tool and let me do my thing. So it doesn't try to get into the middle or, or kind of boggle the, the actual use case or the utilization of the actual COE that you're deploying. Google's recent involvement in OpenStack obviously lends Magnum to be a sweet spot for collaboration because Magnum supports Kubernetes. So definitely keep an eye out as to where that's going in the future. The next project is CoreCube, and this is a project I uh, personally started and maintain. And if you think of Magnum as the full-on suite slash toolbox to deploy this like multi-tenant, you know, multi-COE deployment, CoreCube is the complete opposite. CoreCube is really just about a simple, easy way to deploy a proof-of-concept project uh, of Kubernetes running 
uh, on OpenStack in CoreOS uh, VMs. And it does this across not only all Rackspace environments, but also pure native OpenStack. I started it really to understand CoreOS's uh, projects, not just the OS itself, but at CD, Fleet, Flannel, et cetera, and how this all ties into Kubernetes. I also added support for SkyDNS uh, in Kubernetes, if you're familiar with that, which allows native service uh, registration and discovery for pods. It's written in Go. And I, the constant endorsement I say about CoreQ before I finish up here is that it really doesn't require any additional services uh, or installation to use. If you have an OpenStack available and it has heat enabled, that's really all you need. So this is, again, not production ready. By no means uses that. This is just a way to allow you to play with Kubernetes on OpenStack without dealing with the mess of setting it up. So let's get to the meat of what everyone's really here for, the COEs. First up, we have, oh. Apple at its finest. Let's try this again. I'm sure we can edit this out. All right. All right, and we're back. Docker Swarm. Docker Swarm is really about making a, a bunch of different Docker hosts look like a single virtual Docker host and giving you one single API. On top of that, it's really aimed at providing a common slash standard interface for any COE of your choosing, whether it be Kubernetes or Mesos or what have you. If you've used Docker hosts, this is great for one host, but when you start to kind of branch out and think about multiple hosts, that's what Docker Swarm's sweet spot is, right? It's really wanting to be able to allow you to control Docker across many different hosts. So if you've used Docker, using Swarm is pretty much identical, and there's not really a learning curve, if at all. But it's not really battle-hardened yet. There's no container failover, there's no HA for the Swarm processes themselves, and the plugin support for other COEs is still incomplete. A perfect example of this is, Again, with the Kubernetes uh, example, if you're familiar with a pod, which is one or more containers, key part being or more, Swarm thinks a pod is just one container. So if you expand that beyond one container, Swarm just doesn't, doesn't really know what to do. So it kind of starts to set the tone for what's lacking in Swarm. And if they plan on being the standard interface going forward, being able to adapt to the various COEs, or, right, container orchestration engines, that they want to be the interface for is definitely going to be an uphill battle. At the same time, there's no real foundation for enabling microservices and the requirements that those things have. And this is really what we're all after here when it comes to containers, right? It's microservices. Because when you see the power that containers can harness, it's really about being able to deconstruct your monolithic architectures, piecemeal things into its own separate logical um, division, and then giving it the resources to do that. And Swarm just doesn't really have that. Um, again, I have this kind of bias towards Kubernetes because I feel like they just started to get things right from the get-go. They have the concept of the pod and everything around it, um, which, I'll, again, I'll get in uh, two slides, but it really starts to define at least a talking point of how you should be architecting and restructuring your applications. And Swarm is just not aimed at doing that, especially if he wants to be this kind of multiplex way to con uh, control many COEs. However, it's still perfect for smaller dev environments of about less than 50 hosts. This is by no means a hard limit of Swarm. This is just my personal recommendation. And it's the next logical step of controlling and playing with Docker outside of just one physical host. Next up, we have Mesos, slash Mesosphere's DCOS and Marathon. So let's start with Mesos. For all practical purposes, uh, Mesos is a distributed systems kernel and cluster manager. And Mesosphere's DCOS is an OS that encompasses that. So perfect example. You have a Linux kernel, and you have an OS like Ubuntu or Debian that consumes that. The same analogy can be applied to Mesos, as well as Mesosphere's DCOS. Mesos is a distributed kernel, and Mesosphere DCOS is the encompassing of that kernel, as well as providing more enterprise-y type of functionality, from a UI to monitoring, et cetera. On top of that, you can run Marathon, which is really about controlling C group services, as well as Docker containers. And Kubernetes is actually similar to Marathon in the sense that it can run alongside of it or in lieu of. And the reason being is because the Mesosphere folks thought, or at least they, they have a hard stance saying that the Kubernetes scheduler is not as sophisticated as it should be when it comes to controlling containers. So they created a shim that allows you to map Kubernetes resources to Mesos resources. So you can definitely have some sort of intermingling of the two. Another key point you may not know about this set of tools is that Mesos and OpenStack get constantly compared, and, and they even say there's some overlap, but to compare them head-on is kind of doing both a disservice. It's com definitely comparing apples to oranges. 
Traditionally, Mesos is about giving services the resources it needs, and OpenStack is about giving you VMs or uh, the resources it needs. At the end of the day, they both about they go do about uh, giving the resources in some way, but Mesos is definitely more catered to services. OpenStack traditionally VMs. Obviously, OpenStack has moved along in terms of projects like Ironic to instantiate on bare metal, and then Nova Docker driver instantiates VMs. But traditionally, it's VMs. Uh, set up containers is VMs. But the cool thing is that you can actually intermingle these as well. You can run Mesos on top of OpenStack, or you can run OpenStack on top of Mesos. A nice little anecdote is about a year ago, um, eBay, who's been a prominent uh, player in the OpenStack space, they have an internal OpenStack cluster. And essentially what they would do is every time a new developer got hired on, they would get their own uh, VM instance with Jenkins for, their, for their, their builds. And this Jenkins instance would live in a VM on the OpenStack cluster. Well, as they got more developers and they each got their own instance, it basically turned to the fact that they were creating technical raw because these resources were either idling or they were not being used to their full capacity. So they wanted a way to, to kind of restructure that and regain some resources back. So they ran Mesos on top of OpenStack. If I'm not mistaken, they put Marathon on top. And long story short, they were able to minimize their footprint. So there's definitely interplay and interchangeability between the two and, inter and interoperability, but it's definitely done at some expense, right? It's a little wonky, but it can be done. Some resounding endorsements around this whole space um, is that Twitter, Airbnb, and Apple use Mesos. Famously, uh, Apple is using Mesos to power Siri. Verizon deploys all their DC services internally with Mesosphere. And uh, Airbnb, eBay, PayPal, and Yelp all use Marathon. Mesos has been around for a couple of years now. It's definitely reached a mature uh, level, and it's really I ideal for large environments, from hundreds to not thousands of physical nodes. Next up is Kubernetes. And if you haven't heard about Kubernetes by now, kind of living under a rock. Kubernetes is really aimed at being this fully featured, large-scale container management system modeled after Borg. And Borg is an internal cluster manager uh, at Google that powers hundreds, if not thousands, of simultaneous jobs behind the famous Google apps we all come to know and love, such as Gmail and uh, Google Maps. And it's based on decades of running production workloads uh, and the experience around that. So who better suited in terms of the authoritative stance to do that than Google? Besides, we all have confidence in Google, so why not? At least some of us do. Uh, Kubernetes is supported across various different platforms, including OpenStack, Rackspace, AWS, GCE, Azure, Red Hat, et cetera. And some things you may not know, and I think this is really key here, is that Kubernetes takes a stance in defining, again, what the microservices architecture should be. And it's really based around the concept of the pod. And the pod is, I believe, the truly perfect way of encompassing the atomic unit for what an app should be. It's, again, one or more containers that share the same uh, volumes, that share the same uh, C groups uh, resources, that share the same networking namespace. And these pods, these containers living in the same pod, communicate with each other via local host. When you couple that with other concepts from Kubernetes, such as the replication controllers, such as services, labeling, et cetera, it starts to kind of fill out the story of how you actually think about designing your applications to fit into this new microservices model. Replication controllers are a way to allow you to do self-healing uh, in a cluster scope. It obviously gives you replication uh, abilities, as well as allows you um, to really think about uh, your policies that you want to enforce. Couple that with services, which is essentially a load balancing service, AKA a single uh, choke point for multiple pods. And you start to kind of see that Kubernetes is really giving you a language to describe your applications. Kubernetes has no idea what an application it is, from the hello world to this, you know, your, your standard three tier web apps. It just knows and gives you the concepts to allow you to define your business policies, as well as the requirements for the quality of service. And it goes about making sure that those are actually enforced. There's a, uh, specifically, there's add-ons around Kubernetes that come built into it if you want to enable them um, around monitoring for containers, Elasticsearch, uh, UI, and DNS. And DNS is very important here because when you think about restructuring your applications for the container world, a perfect example is say I have a Django app and a MySQL backend. You can put each of those in their own independent container. If you're thinking about one physical Docker host, the way they can communicate is through Docker links. For all practical purposes, the Docker link is a private network tunnel between the two. And the, my, the, the Django is given basically the socket of how to access MySQL. So this is great and all on one host, but when you start to think about multiple hosts, 
that doesn't really apply. Links aren't natively meant to work like that. So a pattern has emerged known as the ambassador pattern, which essentially is a proxy between the containers that resides on both hosts. And these proxies, or these ambassador proxies rather, they serve nothing more than to allow the communication between different hosts in your cluster. But they are also flawed because they too depend on Docker links. And the biggest flaw about Docker links is that if the Django depends on MySQL, the second MySQL's container goes up or down, or the sockets change, or something happens to it, there's no way of notifying the Django of those changes. So Docker links are pretty much useless if you have no way of dynamically finding out their information. So the DNS is very important because through SkyDNS, for example, it ties in well with the concept of Kubernetes services, again, which is a load balancer. So DNS lends itself uh, natively to just allow you to communicate with the current information stored for the container. And this, again, is in, uh, not only uh, inter in integral into the overall concept of containers, but it comes natively built into Kubernetes, something that does not exist in Swarm, naturally, nor in Mesos. And that's very important because containers are very ephemeral. They come up and down uh, much more often than VMs. Other COEs and ecosystem tools in the container space are looking to integrate with Kubernetes if they haven't already. So that speaks volumes about their, their front runner status. It's really ideal for about 100, 100 nodes right now. The platform.net recently uh, had a, a publication how they basically uh, tested this to support 100 physical nodes, 3,000 pods, but Google found out the issues that they were having, um, and they plan on being able to support up to 1,000 nodes by the end of this calendar year. The force behind Kubernetes is outstanding. From a community standpoint, since their first init in June 2014, Kubernetes has seen almost 20,000 commits from almost 600 contributors, and they're averaging about 250 to 300 commits per week. But to put that into perspective, Ars Technica recently stated that I think uh, the kernel version 3.17, if I'm not mistaken, saw around 1,300 commits per week. So Kubernetes is about a fifth of the uh, commits uh, compared to the Linux kernel, which is pretty impressive. It's being used in production today by Box, eBay, Red Hat, and many others. Next up, we have specialized systems, or I like to call it like, or one-offs, that definitely still fit into the container space, but aren't necessarily a COE themselves. First up is Engine Yard's Dayaz. Dayaz is really aimed at being this PaaS layer to facilitate app deployment and management. It's built on Docker, as well as CoreOS products from etcd fleet and the OS itself. And it's really about structurally, structurally abiding the Heroku 12-factor methodology. So for all practical purposes, it's a private Heroku clone. However, it lacks persistent storage and state-aware support for applications. And that's very important when you, think, when you talk about the container world. Because in Docker, the philosophy is everything should be in a container, including your, your more stateful information such as databases, message queues, et cetera. And I'll get to this more on, uh, on the next topic, but that is a big key point about containers. So if you don't have a way to support stateful stuff, I mean, you're kind of, kind of doing the, your application a disservice. Dayaz, however, also leverages Heroku build packs, kind of speaking to the Heroku story. It can be deployed anywhere on prem or in the cloud. And V2, that they're about to release soon, is set to be running on top of Kubernetes also. Again, going back to the story that Kubernetes is kind of the the, the, show stop, the show runner here. Dayaz also is being used by some small to medium businesses. There's not a whole lot of Fortune 1000 companies that I noticed, but nevertheless, it is getting use. Next up, we have Prime Directives Flynn, which for all practical purposes, is a direct competitor to Dayaz, also a PaaS uh, layer aimed at solving stateful problems, as well as the more stateless stuff around Heroku. It's less prescriptive in the technology it uses than Dayaz, but again, it is a private Heroku, but it's not limited to the 12-factor uh, methodology. It does provide an appliance for auto-provisioning, HA, and failover abilities for Postgres as a backend, and it's looking to expand that to other uh, databases as well. Some endorsements around Flynn, Coinbase, Shopify, CenturyLink, all utilize it. Next off, this is very different from Dayaz and Flynn, is Flocker. Flocker is a data volume and multi-host container manager. So before I kind of go into details of what Flocker does, again, the whole point of this is that everything should be in a container. At least if you've bought into the container story, that's what you're trying to do. So when you start thinking about how do I put your databases, your message queues, into a container, given the fact that containers are so ephemeral and they come up and down, you don't want your stateful stuff to just drop. You want to be able to persist that, uh, that data in some capacity. And that's what Flocker's really aimed at doing. It's about being able to 
uh, allow you to, to use containers for your more stateful stuff, and it does it in two different ways. It uses a backend to allow, enable a shared or local uh, storage fabric, and it uses a front-end proxy to allow you to do the proper routing for the containers you're interested in doing or uh, utilizing, depending on where they're at. So you don't have to actually maintain or worry about your containers residing in the same physical host. If they are, that's great, but if they're not, you still want to be able uh, to communicate with them. And the back-end storage actually has support uh, today for AWS as Elastic Block Storage, and there's even support for OpenStack Cinder. EMC is enhancing Flocker to work with their extreme IO and scale IO drivers. VMware also partnered up with them to enable their drivers. And it's now available as an official Docker plugin um, as of, I believe, Docker 1.7. Flocker just hit version 1.0, and they're definitely picking up a lot of steam. So keep an eye out for them if you're worried or interested about how to maintain your stateful data. Next up are micro OSs. We all know CoreOS. Um, it's essentially a minimal Linux OS, aimed at being like the distro for massive server deployments. And it really does uh, OS. Uh, it really describes an OS in a different way that embraces containers. It provides a subset of tools or a toolbox um, in terms of your basic uh, binaries. And then it says everything else in user land needs to live in a container. And so that, that really kind of moves the conversation of maintaining, upgrading, updating your servers because long gone are the days where if I update, say, OpenSSL, it breaks some package that depends on that. So if everything is self-contained in a container in user land, then everything underlying can be updated obviously without, like, say, the kernel, for example, but everything else can be updated and the application itself would not be bothered. CoreOS is a fork of Chrome OS, and its flagship projects at CD and Fleet were born out of necessity. Specifically, uh, CoreOS, again, is aimed at being a way to manage and update your, your OSs in, in today, by today's standards. And they really wanted to, be, to have a way to not only update their machines accordingly, but make sure that the reboots happened in a, in a phasing approach. And so they needed a way to track a semaphore to make sure a subset of the machines rebooted at a time instead of the whole cluster. So etcd is really was a way to store that semaphore, and Fleet was a way to coordinate the rollouts of the reboots. Obviously, they have expanded past that, and they are being used uh, by multiple different companies today for various different uses, but that's where they originally started. CoreOS recently acquired Quay.io for both public and enterprise container registry, and it's available across all platforms, including OpenStack. Next up, we have uh, Project Atomic out of Red Hat, kind of similar to CoreOS. Uh, again, it's a minimal OS aimed at managing containers. They took a different stance in terms of how they're approaching it. It's really a security-first focus, more enterprise-driven, and it's baked in with SE Linux by default, something that CoreOS didn't do until their most recent release of 808. Um, so definitely, they have a leg up on CoreOS from that stance. From my Fedora and Red Hat uh, friends, they tell me that using Atomic is very similar to Fedora 20. And it started about six months after CoreOS, so they had some catching up to do, for sure. But definitely, Atomic is best suited for your Red Hat stack, um, especially if you start considering things like OpenShift. There's native support for Kubernetes. Atomic itself is available as open source today, and an EA of an enterprise platform is in the works. And obviously, Atomic becomes an integral part to the OpenShift story, especially if you've bought into the Red Hat uh, ecosystem. Lastly, in the micro OS uh, topic, is Rancher Labs Rancher OS. Kind of the same concept, right? An OS based around containers, but it's doing something differently. It's saying that you not only encompass all of the OS binaries uh, in terms of the subset you're providing in a Docker container, but as well as your user land. And it's doing that in a twofold way. It provides a Docker daemon for the OS itself, kernel aside, and a Docker daemon for the user land apps. So updating the OS concepts is as simple as rolling out a new container, which is very, very easy and efficient. It's still very early in the Rancher Labs story, but they are offering a beta platform. And even though they're smaller compared to CoreOS and Atomic, it's definitely worth keeping an eye on them. For the sake of giving you guys a visual of what all these different tools kind of do, on the left is a Venn diagram I drew that kind of encompasses the major players and, and, the, and the buckets they fit in. You have traditional PaaS layers, your COEs, and your specialized offerings. And you can kind of see where some of them blur the lines, um, such as Flynn and Flocker. On the right is a mind map of the open, uh, the open container ecosystem at like a 30,000 foot view, and this came out of Red Hat. Um, and I definitely encourage you to visit that URL because it really does kind of encompass all the different uh, aspects that are in using containers and how they're being really kind of 
expanded in terms of the OS itself, database configuration, configuration management, um, as well as the OSs. So definitely uh, check that out to kind of understand how things fall into perspective. To kind of reel things in back into OpenStack, um, from, uh, and, and not just harp on containers so much, what should we as a community do for containers? Well, for one, we have to be very aware of the shift in application development, and we have to be able to accommodate that for containers. So much so that some people are worried that there's not really a necessity for OpenStack anymore if containers are going to be so predominant. That's not really the way to look at it. There's still a need for infrastructure management, and CoreOS is best suited, I mean, OpenStack is best suited for that if we know where and when to draw the lines and decouple responsibilities. I strongly, firmly believe that OpenStack should not be the end-all, be-all tool for everybody. The Magnum approach, for example, where it's saying deploy a COE and then kind of take a step back and drop you down to the native APIs is definitely a, a, a true way of saying where OpenStack really fits well into this space. So knowing that, and being able to draw the lines and leave the responsibilities of the management aspects to say the Kubernetes and Swarms and Mesos of the world and not have OpenStack bleed into that will definitely uh, make things easier in terms of adapting containers to your stack when it comes to OpenStack. And if there's one thing I leave you with today, it's this. There's a lot of noise out there. Please pick the right tool for the job and make sure those tools fit and integrate well with your stack. And just because you can mix and match these tools does not mean you should. Perfect example, eBay ran Mesos and OpenStack and they got it to work and they were able to enable a marathon with it. Cool, it worked, but do you really want a convoluted complex stack like that? That just makes for like, further headaches down the road. With that said, I point you to this GitHub link of a couple of white papers I wrote several months ago that are still very relevant today. Um, and this presentation was a condensed version of that. They're easy reads, perfect for the plane ride back home if you have nothing to do for 12 hours. Uh, and if you're on Twitter, follow me on Twitter, and I'll take any questions if you have any. Go for it. Could you uh, maybe take a minute to compare and contrast AppSea versus the other container project? Sure. So where do I start? So, yeah, I'll repeat the question. So uh, the question was, can I compare the AppSea spec and how that falls in line with the Open Container Foundation? So. You have to understand, right, again, Docker just kind of created, the Docker, the company, created Docker. And they defined the manifest and the specs after the fact. So some people are kind of thinking, obviously, that's a wonky way of doing it because we should define what we want out of these tools uh, before we actually implement it. There is, if you guys have been following, there was kind of some debate or some, like, some bad blood between the CoreOS folks and the Docker folks uh, because CoreOS just came out of nowhere with the AppSy spec and with Rocket. And because they're so firmly, CoreOS so firmly believes that Docker didn't get it right the first time. The AppC spec is a communal way of saying what do we want containers to be and what those containers should actually be encompassing. And so the foundation was kind of a way of saying, hey, you know, we're friends again, but also we sh you're right, we should probably take a community first approach. And so Docker said, we're going to donate the run C uh, runtime, which essentially is a wrapper for lib container. And yeah, we'll embrace uh, uh, the CoreOS folks and their necessities around AppC spec. But that was a couple months ago, right? That was in July. And not really much has changed. So the community is kind of like divided right now in terms of the Docker camps and the, and the AppC spec camps. Um, as, as I said earlier, there's a lot of it. There's four or five implementations of the AppC spec. So there's definitely some meat behind that. Um, time will tell how Docker kind of goes forward with this. A lot of people don't really necessarily believe that Docker is, you know, they're, they're trying to play nice for the sake of playing nice, but I don't think they will. People don't believe they have real intentions of adopting the AppSea spec, or at least they want to be the most influential voice at the table. So does, does that answer your question? Cool. Any other questions? Going once, twice, sold. All right, cool. Thanks, guys.